on the next session, which is around the uh, architecture and interoperability. Uh, so I hope there's been some questions now um, during the week, especially around this interoperability. What do we do with the uh, legacy data and other systems, etc.? So I hope we can address some of those uh, in this session. Uh, so I'll start by giving a bit of an introduction, um, talking about uh, what we, at least from the sort of his DHIS2 side, see as the key things of an information system architecture. Um, also talking a bit about interoperability integration and what we mean by that. And then how DHIS2 specifically um, can be sort of fitted into an information system architecture for a country um, and how it supports different types of interoperability integration. Um, so I'll start with a, an introduction on this and then we have um, a bit of a practical exercise uh, where we finally get to use all the flip charts we have standing around the room. Um, so that's the plan for this section. So I'll start with um, talking about information system architecture. So what is an architecture? I think very often when you think of architecture, you think of houses, buildings, and then you think of these kind of blueprints, the instructions for how to build something. Um, so there are a few different ways to define uh, uh, architecture. One way is to say that it's all the different components that you, that you have in the system and how they relate to each other. That's one way to see architecture. Uh, another definition is um, the design structure of a uh, system. Um, and of course, like Anna talked about this morning, when we talk about the information system, it's not just about the technology, it's also about all the things that you need to have supporting the technology, the, the people and the processes uh, and the non-technical um, elements. So like I said, information system architecture is not just about uh, the databases and the devices and the internet. Uh, it's about the overall system and the people that are part of that system. Uh, and I think in some ways, this kind of presentation of an architecture can be a mis bit misleading because this is very static image. This is a picture of what what do you think today that you are building? Uh, but in practice, we see that information systems, they are always evolving, they are changing. So this kind of drawing of the system, that's a snapshot. It can be a plan, something you're building towards, but it's always changing. Uh, maybe after this week, some of you will sort of think a bit differently about how you would want to structure your information system. So sort of on a, month by month, year by year, your definition of the architecture is evolving. Uh, so sort of talking about how things relate to each other in the system is a bit, uh, it's a bit abstract, but specifically when we're talking about health information system, it can be how does the HMIS system you use for routine reporting of uh, facility data. How does that link to your human resource system? How does it link to your lab information system? Uh, and what sort of, what is the relationship between them? If there is a link, are they sharing data? Uh, are you sharing facility codes in the master facility list, etc.? Uh, so that's sort of from the HISP side, what we typically sort of, the way we think of health information systems and architectures. And of course, there are people who uh, have spent a lot of time trying to come up with this sort of best practice reference architectures for health information systems. Uh, how many of you have seen this drawing? Can you raise your hand? One or two. So this is, uh, it's a bit old, but it's, uh, it's coming from a quite big initiative from around 2007-8 called the Health Metrics Network, which was sort of a WHO-led initiative uh, to strengthen health information system. 
And they came up with this framework describing uh, sort of how you can structure and think of health information systems. Um, what are the different types of data sources coming from the population, coming from the institutions? Um, and sort of a key, key element of that health, inf uh, health metrics network architecture was to have uh, a data repository that everything is sort of feeding into a data warehouse. Uh, so that's one example of a sort of reference architecture. A newer example is this uh, Open HIE uh, architecture. How many of you have heard about Open HIE or seen this slide? Uh, a couple. Uh, so here it's sort of a different concept. While the HMN framework was all about bringing everything into one data repository, the key here is that you have lots of different uh, separate systems system, you have a shared health record, you have an HMIS, you have a finance system, separate systems supporting uh, some standards for interoperability. And then you have an interoperability layer that is connecting all these systems together. So this is sort of, a, in some ways, it's a complete opposite. Here, it's about taking everything into one data repository. Here it's about having lots of different individual sort of components that you link together with a, some sort of interoperability layer, ideally then built on some standards. And I think what we see sort of from, again, with our DHIS2 uh, glasses on is that these kind of reference architectures, whether it's the HMN data warehouse kind of approach or it's the open HIE, uh, they're very useful in terms of providing some concepts, some examples. Um, uh, for example, trying to think of what are actually the different sort of domains that you need within your health information systems. Uh, so we are, for example, uh, one of the founding members of the OpenHIE uh, community. But I think where we disagree with some people is that uh, we don't think these are sort of the, the answer to the question, how should your information system architecture look like? So this kind of reference architectures is useful to discuss, to sort of have a, uh, improve our understanding of the different components. Uh, so they're a good inspiration, but they're not a blueprint that you should build the country system based on. Uh, when you're building your national architecture, you should look at what is actually, what are the systems I have now? How do they work? What am I missing? Uh, what kind of resources do we have? Uh, what kind of people do we have? Um, that, that's the kind of thing that should inform the national architecture. Uh, so these are useful for inspiration, but they're not sort of the answer to what every country should try to develop. Uh, so I think it's important to have some sort of plan, to have a drawing saying this, this is what I'm building towards. Um, but then, as I said initially, things change, things evolve. Uh, so you shouldn't think of what you made last year. You developed your information system architecture and that's that will be there for five years until you make a new plan. It's something that you need to update um, over time. Uh, at least I think it's very fun to make this kind of drawing, say this is the system and it's linked to this system and then you can feed data from this system. Uh, but it's of course also a bit misleading. It's not just about making two systems talk. It hides a lot of other non-technical issues. For example, we had the session uh, this morning about governance. Who is actually the one deciding on the overall architecture? Who decides when we should add a new system? Who decides what systems to prioritize when we're looking at the integrations? Um, each of these boxes, it might be sort of uh, owned by a different department within the ministry, um, supported by different uh, people and organizations. I think it's also important to keep in mind that this sort of concept, client registry, facility registry, 
uh, is not necessarily sort of directly translatable to one information system, one database. Uh, so, for example, what we see in many countries that use DHIS2 as the HMIS, the system for routine reporting from health facilities, that is very often the most updated database of health facilities because you can't report in an HMIS unless the health facility is in that system. So every month or maybe even every week, people update the facility list in the HMIS because otherwise they can't report. Uh, so very often the HMIS, for example, could serve the function as a uh, facility registry without being a separate database, but just because there is an incentive uh, to keep it updated. Uh, another example that we see in many places now uh, is that countries get support to set up what they call malaria data repositories. Uh, so bringing in malaria data from surveys, from routine data, from, uh, from estimates. And they say, okay, we need a new database, a new instance to have our national uh, malaria repository. Well, in fact, it could just be that you say, oh, well, we have our HMIS. It already has all the routine malaria data. We can add the malaria uh, survey results, and then we have our national malaria repository. It doesn't have to be a new database, a new system, just because you have this new concept. So I, I won't go into the detail here, but just a few uh, examples. This is one from uh, Kenya. This is how they sort of define their their architecture, uh, where you have, for example, the medical record systems feeding into an aggregate database. Um, you have logistics database feeding into this. Uh, you have, for COVID surveillance, they uh, set up a separate instance just for the surveillance work linked to the aggregate system. Uh, they have human resource system. And you see here some of them actually specifies what sort of interoperability standards they use as well. Another example, this is uh, from Norway, uh, where DHS2 was used for um, COVID surveillance, COVID contact tracing in a lot of municipalities. So they had the DHS2 tracker used as the, the system for the COVID cases, for the contact tracing, um, also for port of entry. Uh, and uh, then they linked DHS2 then to all these other systems that was already in place. So a lab database, uh, the surveillance database, population registry and the contact registry. So feeding in the demographic data based on the identifiers, vaccination system, uh, and this port of entry database that was already in place. Uh, so that was just a few examples of ways to sort of define the, the national architectures. Moving over to the integration interoperability. I think they're sort of very closely related. Because uh, if you think of this kind of architectures, the different systems, you draw a line between them. That's, of course, a question of interoperability, integration, the way the different systems are connected together. Uh, so sort of very simplified definition, what we, uh, at least I think of when we talk about interoperability and integration is that inter interoperability is about making two systems able to communicate, exchange data or information. Whilst when we talk about integration, it's about making the system function as one, making two systems function as, it, as if it was one. So of course, to have integration, you very often need interoperability to do the work in the background to link the systems. Uh, and I think, Key when you think of interoperability, it's very easy to say, well, it makes sense that this system is connected to this system. But what is the actual benefits? Who, who is going to use the output of linking those systems? And how does that compare to the cost? 
because interoperability projects is often expensive, complicated, and it's something you need to maintain over time. So you really need, really need to consider are the benefits we get from doing this greater than the cost? Um, and of course, another thing related to the architecture is, well, we have a new system in our plan for what we want the system to look like. It's actually, what are the kind of int integrations we are planning to have that is part of our architecture? Um, and then also keeping in mind that when you're setting up this, you're not setting it up. I think Anna also talked about this morning. You're not setting it up for the for nine months or two years. This kind of large scale information systems is there for many years. So they typically outlive sort of project periods um, and become part of the sort of infrastructure of the of the health system. One way to look at interoperability is sort of think of it as a something that is layered. And if you think of it sort of from a, in a time perspective, the first thing is that someone needs to actually agree on making two systems interoperable or integrated. So it's sort of a political organizational thing, first and foremost, that's maybe the most complicated part of integrating systems is getting the people who are responsible to actually agree on doing this. The next level is defining what are we actually, what is the de definition? What are we sharing between these systems? What are the concepts? What is the definition of these different variables? And then at the bottom is the technical uh, level. What is this kind of technical standards we're gonna use to connect this system? Uh, and the idea here is showing the complexity. Very often the focus is here, what, what kind of standards are we gonna use? But that's very often the easiest part. Most difficult part is getting agreement on what, what to do. So there is a comparison here uh, from a telephone conversation. The first thing is, do you want to talk? If you don't want to talk, there's no point in going into the details. And then it's, can we actually understand each other? Do we have the same language? And the technical level is, do we actually have a phone with power and connectivity to talk? And if you really want to dig into this kind of thing, this is from a book that a few of the, our colleagues, professors wrote a few years ago. It's getting a bit old, but I think a lot of the sort of concepts and thinking there is still valid. It's uh, there's a source in the slides that you have access to for the whole uh, book. So I think the, the top level is to a large extent that's about governance uh, like we talked about uh, this morning. When we get to the syntactic level, sort of the definitions of what is being exchanged, uh, that's a very critical component. Uh, so one thing is that you actually need to agree what are the variables, the data elements indicators that we want to exchange? How do we define them? What is actually, what are the health facilities in the different systems, the organization unit hierarchy? Do they have the same identifiers, the same code so that we can actually share data? Uh, if you're exchanging information about Patients or people, do they have some sort of unique identifier that you can use to identify them in both systems? Uh, and aligning this, it could either be done sort of by updating what is in, in, in the two systems, or often you have to end up with some sort of middleware that maps what is in this system to what is in the other system. Uh, and of course, the difficult thing here is that this needs to be maintained. If you for as many years as you want this to work, someone needs to be responsible for making sure that if you change something in one system, you change it in the other system, otherwise it breaks. So this is something you need to have a plan for and maintain forever. Uh, of course, standards makes it easier to do the technical interoperability. Uh, 
So from the DHS2 side, uh, we're able to produce uh, data in this FHIR format. I don't know how many have heard about FHIR. It's, yeah, not so many. It's uh, quite new and a bit uh, trendy. Um, so we do have the possibility of producing data in this format, but I don't think we have examples where it's actually being implemented in countries. Uh, we also support this aggregated data exchange format, uh, which is another standard part of the, this OpenHIE framework. But again, I don't think it's very many implementations that actually use this. And then, of course, we have the the tries to can import and export CSV files, etc., JSON files. And, but these are the standards we have um, built in. But like I said, in practice, especially if you're thinking of linking DHS2 to existing systems that are maybe a few years old, they will typically not have this uh, from before. So then it doesn't really help that you have it on the DHS2 side because you would in any case need to have some sort of custom uh, technical solution. Okay, so sorry. I just wanted to take sort of go through one scenario. Uh, and look at sort of what are the alternatives in practice. Let's say you have uh, you have your HMIS with your monthly reporting coming in from facilities. So every every month the facilities report uh, data into the system. And then in parallel, you have an EPI system where the facilities report uh, just the immunization data. So there is maybe half of the immunization data is also part of this, but not all of it. So they still want to have this data. Uh, how many of you can recognize this kind of parallel reporting from your countries where you have multiple systems collecting the same data from health facilities? Can you raise your hands? No one? Okay, it's at least in, I would say in uh, 90% of the countries we work with, you have this situation. Multiple uh, reports coming from facilities with the same data. So what are the options if you want to do something here? One option is of course to not do anything. So just continuing with the parallel reporting. Uh, but that's not so interesting to talk about here. The other alternative is to figure out a way for these two systems to exchange data, either both ways or one way. Why would you want to do this? Well, maybe, maybe this system also has data on uh, maternal health and deliveries. It would be useful to be able to triangulate that with your immunization data. Maybe it has data on logistics, so you could look at your vaccine logistics together with the uh, vaccines provided. So there, I think there are many ways, many reasons for wanting to do this. Uh, and then the, the third option is stop using this and including the information in this EPI report as part of what goes into the system. And how do you decide on what makes sense? I think there are a few few things that we see are important in deciding this. Coming back to this uh, all the time, governance, ownership. If you are the EPI department, this is your system. Maybe you don't want to just say, okay, we'll stop using our system. We'll just use your system. This is a system that they own and manage. They can do what they want. It might not be easy to convince them that this is more efficient way of doing it, even though uh, uh, there are sort of rational reasons. Another factor here is the cost. Uh, and typically that's uh, a factor that is sort of to the advantage 
of getting rid of one of the systems. So if you have one system, you can maybe have one server instead of two servers. You can have uh, one team that is trained instead of two teams. Um, you can train end users in one systems instead of two systems. They can use one uh, device in the facilities instead of two, maybe. So there, are, I think there are lots of possibilities of resource saving. Third factor is, of course, the functionality. Uh, maybe this system has some functionality. This system has. Maybe it's critical. Maybe it's not. But that's will influence what you end up doing in the end. If you really have something in this system that this system cannot do, for example, in terms of analytics, then this is your only option if you want the systems to work together. Final thing is, of course, how difficult is it to make the two systems exchange information? Uh, and like I said initially, the, it's often the key consideration. What is the benefit of doing this versus what is the cost? Uh, and what is the complexity? Maybe it's quite easy. Maybe it's very difficult technically. Uh, I've been using EPI here on purpose because that's a very good example we've seen um, with DHIS2. That DHIS2 has been used for many years as the HMIS, including the immunization data. But the immunization programs have been very reluctant to give up their um, parallel system. Uh, and this parallel system in many, many countries have been based on Excel or Microsoft Access. So the cost is not really a big argument because most, if you have a computer in the district, you probably have Excel. So there is no huge maintenance cost to the system. Uh, for a long time, there was also some functionality that was missing in DHIS2. So they were saying, well, if we move from our Excel system to DHIS2, we can't do monitoring charts anymore. I don't know if you know this vaccine monitoring charts, looking at the cumulative numbers of vaccinated children from January to December. So there were some specific features um, that they couldn't do. So they said, well, we can't use DHIS. We will keep our system. Uh, and of course, this. In one sense, it's very easy to do that with Excel. You can make a CSV file and import into DHS. But to have like a permanent <laughs> interoperable solution with uh, between Excel and DHS is not so easy. You change at the row or column to Excel, it breaks. Um, so for all these reasons, for a long time, countries using DHS2 as the HMIS, they kept on this parallel API reporting, even though it would be very easy to set this up in DHS. Uh, this is changing now. And an uh, important reason for that is that DHS2 now supports uh, these special visualizations that the API programs couldn't do in DHS initially. There's also been some questions uh, this week from the from you around sort of historical data from other different systems. How can we get that into DHIS? So in the cases where you're sort of going from this, you're stop, you'll stop using an old system and you start integrating it in the DHS in this case. Uh, that's quite a common uh, scenario. So we have uh, different tools that allows you to do this. Uh, so one of the core applications of DHIS2 is a, what we call the import export app. So if you have your data, you can transform it into a CSV file or JSON file uh, that can be imported through um, the user interface, assuming that you've been able to map all the variable names and codes and everything, of course. Um, DHIS2 has a web API, which lets you post this in a more sort of programmatic way rather than through the user interface. We haven't really talked much about this uh, app hub 
that we have for DHS2, where uh, people can develop apps and uh, make them available for other users, similar to uh, what you have on your phone with app stores. Uh, but there are several applications developed by uh, in the DHS2 community for doing data import. So I've linked here to uh, one app called the Data Import Wizard, for example. So we'll, uh, we'll give a quick demo of that later. But of course, this is sort of the, the technical, yeah, and then you could also just put it in the database, but we don't really recommend that because that will then not do a lot of the validations and integrity checks that is happening when you do the other, uh, use the other methods. So that's sort of a last resort. This is very easy if you have everything using the same identifiers or names or codes both for the data and the organits, but typically there is a process in between there where you need to see, sit and map and fix the spelling mistakes of all the health facilities because this is spelled like this in this system, it's spelled a bit differently here. Um, so I, I'm not gonna say it's a very easy or pleasant task, but it's uh, doable as long as you're able to do the, the data mappings that you need. Sort of generally about the tries to an interoperability, I mentioned this API, which is what is very often used, I would say always used. If you're doing custom interoperability solutions, if you're making some sort of tool that is linking two systems on the DHS2 side, you would use this API. So we have lots of examples of this being used to link it to population registries, for example, for demographic data. Uh, for human resource systems, for uh, connecting with ComCare, OpenMRS, ODK, etc. Um, what we often see, of course, is that a lot of the sort of legacy systems don't have an API. So on the DHS2 side, you can push data to the API, uh, but you need to figure out something else uh, on the source system, whether it's exporting to CSV and then converting it or it depends. Yeah, this is uh, again, just in a way repeating uh, what I've said earlier about the metadata mappings. You need to make sure you have the same definitions, the same, same codes and maintaining it over time. In general, if you're planning on having a system architecture with lots of integrations, lots of separate systems, a bit like the open HIE kind of approach, uh, you could consider also then setting up this kind of middleware, which is a system that has as its only job to link all the other systems together, transform the data in the way that ways that are needed. So I will just open this. If you want to read more, we have this dedicated uh, page on integration interoperability. Uh, I'm showing this mainly to just show some examples. You can find lots of examples here. Um, but these are two of the sort of middleware solutions that can connect to DHS2. So this open function, open him. And then this is a overview of other tools uh, where there has been work on making the making them interoperable with uh, DHS2. So I know, for example, Rapid Pro has been mentioned. Um, earlier. Okay, on, on this website, you will also find uh, what we've called the uh, his principles for integration interoperability, which I think is sort of a summary of what I've been talking about here. First principle is that the uh, project should support country goals. The challenge sometimes with these reference architectures is that there will be partners who really want to get countries to use this nice thing that has been drawn up. So there's often a lot of pressure. You should do it this way. Uh, which sometimes is good for the sort of aligned with the country plans, but sometimes it's not. I think 
first principle is that whatever you do in terms of interoperability should be actually aligned with what the country wants, not some partner pushing their best practice uh, architectures. Second principle is that whatever you do in terms of linking systems, it should actually benefit the users and there should be some clear value. Um, and related to this, the value should be greater than the cost because we know that this interoperability is often uh, expensive and complicated and it's something you have to maintain for years. Interoperability should be done. Sharing of data should be done because there is some benefit of actually sharing this data for in terms of data use. So what is useful as a starting point when you're discussing linking systems is actually discussing with the people who will be using the data and asking them what, what is it actually that you want. It shouldn't be started by the technicians who say, well, we could, we could link these systems. Technically, it would be quite easy. The starting point should be what is the outputs and what is the data you want to be able to um, use in an integrated way. The systems and architectures, like I've said, they should be designed locally for the country, not trying to replicate some uh, abstract ideas. But we also encourage participation in this community that are working on uh, architectures, on concepts, uh, etc. Because it's useful, they come up with useful concepts, they come up with standards that can be used, etc. Okay, I'll uh, give you a break from just talking uh, and I'll actually do some uh, examples of some of this, focusing on essentially getting uh, different ways to get data into DHS. Uh, so we'll show a few different uh, ways of doing that so that you can actually believe me when I say it's possible and not just something I put on the slides. Okay, so first thing I'll do is to use this import export application that I was uh, talking about. And please don't laugh if, if it doesn't work. I know demos are a bit uh, dangerous. Uh, so I'm logging in now with, um, we set up a new copy of the database that you've been using just to demonstrate this. Uh, so what, what I'll do is just to show you a few different ways to move data into this DHS2 instance. Okay, so. Uh, a bit of both. So I'll have one example where we push and import. Okay, so I'm just using uh, immunization as an example here. So just to prove that it hopefully works in the end. Uh, I'm now, I just picked the health facility uh, in our demo database for March. And as you can see, there is no, no data here. Uh, I will open the import export app. Let me, I will just change the. So I, I've cheated a bit. I have a CSV file ready with the uh, immunization data for March for this province of uh, Laos. Excuse me. Uh, can you repeat the, the last step, please? Excuse me. Yes, I'm here. Sorry? I'm here. I'm here, yes. Uh, yeah, I see you. But... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, please uh, repeat the last step. Could you please, kindly? Yeah, so what I've done is I, I made a CSV file in advance, which I'll import. It includes the 
data for March for one of the provinces in our database. Just to show you how that. Uh, yes. Yes. That I need. Works. I need the first step. Hmm? The first step. Yeah. So the first thing I did was just to open data entry to prove that there is no data there now. Uh, and then I open this application called import export. I think with your uh, demo user accounts, I don't think you have access to actually open it. So if you see uh, access denied, that's because your accounts don't have the, all the admin admin functions. Uh, so you see here, this app, it has uh, supports import of uh, data, of events, Earth Engine, which we talked about uh, yesterday, which is the population estimates, uh, organization units, GIS coordinates, etc. But what I'm doing is importing uh, data. So uh, I know this is very small, but uh, this is a CSV file with all the columns that is needed for imports into DHIS2. Actually, you only need, I think, four of them. You need to have the, this identifies the data element, the period, the health facility. These two are for disaggregations, they're optional, and then the data value. So there are basically four things you need. Uh, yes, uh, this is a predefined template for importing the data. Because and also, this is something I made. Something you made, but so uh, I can sh I can we can share the link to the documentation. There is a specific format you need to have the columns in the right order, but then you populate it. Sometimes I use uh, just a SQL database. Sometimes I just copy paste in Excel, but it needs to just have those the right order of the columns. Yes, if you're uh, using the shared language. Yeah, and usually when we when we uh, when we use import and export. We built the template, yeah, pre-made, so you can just fill fill in the data as the system expected. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah, but the, you don't have the templates, but you have the guidelines. Yes. How the templates should so be. So in the. Um... Thank you. Let me just. Uh... So in the documentation, you have this uh, CSV data value format describing each of the columns, what the format is and which ones are required. Okay, so I, I have my uh, file here. This is, here you see what formats are supported. So we have JSON, CSV, XML, this ADX standard and PDF, and this is not any PDF. This is PDFs created by DHIS2 to, to be imported later. The first row is uh, the header row. Then I can first do a dry run, which is just checking if it's uh, it has the right identifiers, etc. Success, it created 3,000 values. So then I can do it uh, for real. Okay, success again. So if I go back to March, I now have my values. So that was uh, an example of uh, using the import export app to import a basic CSV file. Next thing I'll do is to use uh, what we call the data exchange app. This is a new app that uh, was released now for the latest version of DHS2. So I don't think it's been widely used uh, many places yet. Uh, so this application is an application that lets you set up.
Yeah, so now, now this data that I imported, it's available as if someone had entered it. Uh, so what, is, what is needs to be done now before this appears on our dashboards is that we have this analytics process that actually transforms the data from the source tables into tables that we use for analytics requests. Yeah, so the background, it changes changes the basically moves the data from one database table to another that is more suitable for analytics. No, I can, uh, if you want, I can uh, start it. So typically this is uh, for aggregate systems. This is typically done every night. So it's something you schedule to run every night so that you have the data entered today is available for analysis tomorrow. Yes. So let me just do it now for the last year. So it's a bit fast. Yeah, so this, it probably takes a minute or two. I, we can come back to it. I'll jump a bit and then we can come back with this. Uh, no, I've done. Uh, I need to have this too. Uh, okay, so while this uh, runs, I will show you this data exchange app. Like I said, it's a new app. The purpose of this app is to, it's, it sort of serves two purposes. One is to move data within a DHIS2 instance. If you have case-based data and you define sort of aggregate numbers from your cases. So I want to know how many children were vaccinated today. I can set up a formula for counting that from our case-based data. I can use this app to save that number as an aggregate data value that shows up in my monthly report, for example. The other purpose of this is to move data between different DHIS2 instances. Uh, so what I'll do now is I have DHIS2 running here, and then we have the online instance, which is running, I guess, in uh, Dublin or something. It's a cloud server. Uh, so I'll use this data exchange app to take some data from my laptop and push it to the cloud server. Okay, so this uh, application is not actually bundled with DHIS2. It's something I need to download from the App Hub, the App Store. So you see now there is no data exchange app here. But I can go to the App Hub and I can find uh, data exchange and I can install it. So now I have a new application here for data exchange. Uh, I've cheated a bit and set up the sort of the definition of what should be moved in advance. Um, but I can show you what it looks like. Uh, Olav. Uh, I'm wondering about the application, uh, the text change app. Is it available in a specific version of DHIS2? Yes, 239. 239. Latest version of 239. Uh, because I have tried to check on 2.38 and I didn't find it. No, so it's using some backend functionality that is only in 239. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this application, it relies on specifying in advance what you're actually moving. So I made now a data exchange. I've given it a name. I've said I want to move all these data elements. 
for this, I've only picked one facility just to keep it simple. Uh, and I picked March. So I'm now moving all these data elements. Uh, for this health facility for the month of March. This is what I'm taking out from my laptop. And I define that the target for this data uh, is academies demos slash import. I've set up this uh, secure, it's like a password that is not a password, uh, which we use to secure the data import. And that's basically it. So I just define what I want to move and where I want to move it. So the one I, I if you saw, I call this external data exchange demonstration. I have it here within that. It's giving me a preview now of the data I'm about to move. So these are the data elements. It's BCG doses, uh, DPT, etc. And when I'm ready to move it, I click submit. I'm moving one report to this server for March. Now, fingers crossed. Yes. So now it imported the 26 new values on this online server. So let me find that again. I imported it into this one. Oh no. No, maybe it's. Uh... Yeah. What's the wrong facility? So, uh, March 2023, these are the values that was transferred. Uh, these data exchanges, we have this app and you can see the, the numbers, BCG doses under one, one year, 19, above one, one, et cetera. Uh, this data exchanges can also be scheduled to run automatically. So you can say every midnight, I want to move data from this instance to another instance. Okay. Uh, now, getting even more technical, I want to show one example also of using the API, just making a script and uh, using the API to first export data from my local database and importing it into this online database. Uh, so now I'm um, importing into this facility here. So there is no data there now. This is my homemade uh, script. I'm not a developer, so this is sort of not the professional way of doing it, but it works for a demonstration. Again, I have uh, defined the uh, IDs that I want to move. These are the data elements. I've said the specified, the org init, the period. Oh, I need to change the... This is my local uh, laptop, which is the source. I actually want to move it to online server. This is just to have a temporary file. And then there's only really two lines here that does the export and import. So this line, it will log in to the server and fetch the data. This line will log in to the online server and import the data there. So let's see if it works.
imported. Uh, I think I may be using the same. Uh, I'm importing into the org unit that already has data. Let me find that. You get the quick involuntary demo of some other features. Um, This is the one uh, I'm moving data for. Ah, it was the right one. Yeah, imported 21. Yeah, so that that's then... Uh, I now have data for this org unit, which I imported using the API, just with a homemade small script. So that was the third uh, third example. I'll now ask uh, Shurajit, who is hopefully ready to show you uh, the last one. Uh, so what I've been doing is looking at, I've been moving monthly data. More or less the same could be done with aggregate data from the individual cases. But what Shurajit will be showing you is how to actually Sorry, import no, sure. individual level data, so Sorry. cases. Uh, Ula, uh, sorry. Is it possible to share with us the data, uh, the files for APIs, just yeah. to see, uh, dig deeply into, into it? Yeah, now we can upload it to Moodle, I guess. So we have all the different examples okay, okay, okay. for the... Uh, yeah, you connect to Zoom. Yeah. Okay, so as Olaf mentioned, um, what I'm going to show you is importing some kind of case based data in this scenario. And we're going to use one of the applications that Olaf mentioned, this data import wizard. So you'd follow a similar process as he showed for the data exchange app. You install this through the app hub. It's not something that is there from the beginning, just when you set up your DHIS2 system. So I'm just going to show the program that I'm bringing the data into really quickly just so you can understand the structure, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring data into this case-based surveillance program. It is collecting individual data per case for various surveillance purposes. I'll just open one up. So it has information on their diagnostics, on their lab, on their final classification. And the whole process starts by registering these various demographic details, right? So we're actually registering each individual case. We take their first name, their date of birth, um, their sex, okay? All, all these various characteristics, right? So what Olaf had showed you was this kind of aggregated data. And what we're gonna do now is bring in some individual data, okay? So just keep this in mind. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a couple new cases and I'm going to bring in information for their uh, diagnostic or clinical information and their laboratory request um, kind of process. So um, we'll create some new, uh, what we call events inside of DHIS2, along with new kind of people um, to associate for each of these cases. So the app I'm going to use is called the Data Import Wizard. This is also available on the App Hub, okay? So if I go to another DHIS2 system um, without this installed, you know, I won't see it there normally, okay? This is an extra app that you have to install on your system. Okay, so the way this app works, it works for both aggregate data um, as well as kind of this tracker data, this case-based data. 
and I'm, I'm gonna focus on uh, the tracker data in this example. Okay, the whole idea is that you can basically use many of the methods that Olaf have dis has discussed. You can still use JSON or use something through the API. You can also use a regular Excel spreadsheet, okay, um, to bring this data in. And the whole idea is it, it kind of gives the user a bit of an ability. So in the files that Olaf was showing, the data has to follow a very strict format, okay? You have to map variables um, to very specific kind of characteristics in order to import the data correctly. In these files, it can be a little less structured. You know, that's very common with Excel data in particular, okay? It still, for example, will break if you insert a bunch of columns and things like that out of nowhere, okay? But the whole idea is, let's say, for example, you know, he talked about many examples of integration. Maybe you're bringing in old data, right? So maybe you just do this once and you import, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of records or something, okay? So I'll just bring this in. So I also have pre-prepared my file, okay? Um, it has 10 cases on here, just as an example. And instead of aggregate data, um, this is individual data, right? So we have name details, we have dates of birth, and then we have some different parameters. In this case, I'm bringing in measles cases, okay? So we have uh, information um, on the case itself, what kind of symptoms they had, et cetera, right? Line by line for each individual case. Now the data, if you're using the formats, some of the formats Olav showed you, it will look a little bit different, okay? You don't have to focus. I know some of you want to learn more about that structure. Like I said, we'll post these online so you can have a look, okay? So what I'm gonna do, And I'll just go through the process to explain a little bit. So the whole idea is that within this app, you kind of take each parameter and you map it to columns in your sheet, or maybe if you have a JSON file, you would map it to the JSON file, but it tries to give the user kind of make it a little bit easier to understand, okay? Rather than kind of using specific uh, IDs and variables, which, you know, is not the easiest for everyone to understand, admittedly, right? So in this case, I can just say on, on the left side, um, this is what's in my Excel sheet, maybe. And in the right side, it kind of lists all the organization units in my system. So I can say which organization unit um, or facility, I should say, maybe I'm bringing the data into, for example. And we do this kind of mapping by selecting. Uh, I'll, I'll just go through a couple of more examples here. There's some more information on this page. For example, we have the, this is the name in the system, Jen, given name, Jen, family name is the last name. Okay, then I have my Excel spreadsheet. Here's the columns. It's actually grabbed the data from my columns, the headings from my columns, and I can just map the left side, which is my system, to the right side, which is the columns in my spreadsheet. Okay. So I'll just kind of go through some of these real quick. Okay. Um, then we have all the different processes. Um, I'm going, I know I'm going through this a little quick. I just want to show the process um, where we go through and we kind of identify. There's a lot of different individual variables, but same thing, right? On the left side are my system name. On the right side is the Excel spreadsheet. I just map everything between them. And we do the same, let me find one with options. Okay, we do the same for all the option, like the lists, the dropdowns. So when you have individual data, you might have dropdowns. You have to match all of that as well, okay? Yes. Sometimes we will, of course, make state by state inside the program. Yeah. And make, uh, link it's a good question. I'm actually going to import two stages at the same time to show you guys. Okay. But you can do it all at once. You don't have to do it all, all separately. I know that's a common way with tracker data sometimes, stage by stage. You have a lot of stuff. I would also say it depends on the size of your data. Like if you have millions of records, you probably want to parse them out into smaller pieces. Otherwise, it's just going to bring your system to a halt. But uh, you can theoretically do, do multiple stages together. Okay. So, okay, we'll ignore this error. So um, in this tool, it gives you a preview of what you're going to import before you actually perform it. So I have a couple examples, for example, of cases. Here's this person, their details. Um, it's mapped the, the columns in my, in my spreadsheet to the actual details of this person, David Smith. He's born on um, May 1st, 1990. He's male. These are his, his home address, his village, et cetera. 
his epid number, he has measles, okay? Just gives me a preview of all that information. Same with the events. You can see I'm bringing in data for two different stages here, the clinical one and the lab request, okay? Um, so I'm able to bring in data um, for multiple stages at the same time. And uh, let's pray a little bit to the gods. Okay, and let's see where we're at. Okay, we have 10 successes. So let's see where we're at now. So I'm going to go to the place that I said I was going to import these through the user interface, which was this one here. And I'll select my program. And here we go. I have 10 new cases. Okay, and if I open them up, Okay, so here's the data for one stage, of this diagnostic and clinical information line by line for that particular person. It's brought in some information um, and I've just filled it in. And then we have the lab request. It's also brought that in. So I can see that I'm able to bring in large, well, I know I just showed a very small piece of data just for example purposes, but you can do this with large pieces of data. It does take more time, of course. You would probably want to separate your data out especially if it's this type of case-based information, right? If you have a million records, two million records, whatever it might be, and that's the reality, right? You, you might have millions of records or cases or events, okay? You, you typically break them down into smaller pieces, you know, maybe you bring in 10,000 at a time or something like this, right? And then you kind of let it go through its process and then you go to the next 10,000, okay? You wouldn't bring in 2 million records at once, but, but the, those details we can discuss. But the whole idea is that there are a number of tools to bring in this data. You've seen a number of examples of aggregate data. You've seen it working. Similarly with the tracker data, we have multiple models, multiple methods that we can bring in that data, either if it's historical data or if it's maybe data that you want to kind of exchange on a more routine basis. Do you advise to use production or just to have because it's a new update. So can we start testing on that? I would definitely start testing first on your any with anything anything new. Yes. Yeah. So for production. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you test it on development and it's working, then of course I think it's okay to use this app. This app has been around for a while, so yeah. Especially if you're like a you know maybe it's like ten thousand records or something, not a huge amount. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I would definitely. I, but this app is uh, production ready. I would say. Yeah. For that, uh, it was uh, really rocket science. For <laughs> yeah. uh, Nick, yes. let's assume that we have uh, a common data element and it's used in, in two stages, like temperature, for example. Temperature, mm -hmm. it's available in stage one and available in stage two. Uh, how it can be represented in, in the same uh, way? Because yeah. Because it's the same, the same data element. Yes. But yeah. It's available here and here. Yeah, yeah. You could, if you're using Ola's method, you could use the same unique identifier. Yes, it's the yeah. same unique identifier. Yeah. In, in in this particular instance, you would just because you're mapping the variables by stage. So if in the first stage the temperature, you just say, okay, here's my temperature on the left column, on my right column. Let me match it to temperature. I would go to my next stage, I would do the same thing, just select the same temperature heading. Oh. And then it would just pull from the same source and in both cases. Maybe, maybe mm. the question about how uh, viewing the same uh, data element if it's uh, uh, replicated in several stage, for example, age or no, no, age is attribute. If mm. you say that temperature, mm -hmm. and we need to see a different the doctor screen and nurse screen. Yeah. The set of right again was the uh, nurse in her report. So okay. the doctor can see that and the same in the doctors. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay, sorry, did you really want to? Yeah, turn it on, hit the button. The, the big button, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, here we, we need to make sure we're not mixing up uh, aggregate and uh, uh, tracker data because your question about repeated stages was related to tracker and here we're dealing with the event. So there, there'll be no uh, interference there, but whereas with aggregated data, you, you will just have the value in the period. So that's that's uh, should not be a problem whatsoever. And uh, having 
heard when you mentioned the uh, same data element in, in different stages. Here, we can also talk later about the, the new options that you could utilize the data in visualizations with the line listing apps and so on. But uh, for, for this process of migration, it's it should not be a problem because the events, they have the special UID by themselves, so you will not mix up the, the values there. But on the data entry level, uh, my question about the transaction, that's a data entry level. While entering, so the data will be presented in a stage. That's the question in Tracker. Yeah, so in, in Tracker, uh, you, you will have to configure program rules if you want to have the... Which version? Hmm? 39? Uh, which version? He's talking about the data. Um, Which version? Maybe we can talk about where we can sit together. Yeah, let's sit down. And make this. Yeah, yeah. But it's good that you have specific concerns. Let's sit down and, and try to go through them. Yeah. Any other quick questions before I hand it back to Olaf? Okay. Uh, well, like I said, I know this for some of you, this might be something you're not completely familiar with. That's okay. I think the main thing that we wanted to show you was that it's possible to bring in data from different sources using different methods in, in both of the, in the various data models that we have. Okay. So I'll hand it back to Olaf and you can continue. Thanks, Rajit. Uh... So I'm actually, um, I'm done talking. Um, so we have now, we're a bit, we've been a bit slow, but I think we'll just steal a few minutes. So the next, uh, but now we have a, a three part exercise. First part of the exercise is um, just spending four minutes in an Excel sheet that we've shared on Moodle, which is something we've used a few places and that we find quite useful. Um, when you're starting to sort of think of the architecture, it's just to quickly make an overview of the different systems, what they're used for, what is sort of the owner of the system? What is the technology? Does it have an API, et cetera? Because then that's sort of the building blocks when you start later to think of what your system looks like. So, oh, I'm sharing the wrong. Um... It looks like this. So, since we're a bit behind uh, on time, just take a few minutes to see now working on your own sort of implementation, your own country. The idea here is to say, okay, I have an immunization system. It's run by the API program. It's case-based. It's used in these many facilities. It's used in the whole country. Data is coming from the primary healthcare level. So basically we're adding, adding the different key systems that is currently being used here. Just spend uh, four minutes on that. And then the main, then the fun part is to, yeah, I'm not sure, yeah. But I think there's more time on the. So that that's the first part. Just spending uh, five minutes on uh, that template. Then what we wanted to do is to sit together in the different uh, country teams, sort of. Uh, we have a couple of big groups, so you can decide if you want to sit together or if you want to split in two. Uh, but the idea is then to take. Uh, one of the flip charts, we should have at least one, two, three, four, five. I think we should have enough of those flip charts uh, to sit and then try to draw up 
try to make a drawing of your current architecture. What are the systems? Which ones are related to each other? Like a snapshot of the situation today. Of course, it's not possible to get everything in, but as much as you are able to. That's part one. Second part is trying to think of where you want to be in two years and then make a drawing of that. How do you imagine your information system will be structured in two years? Is it uh, clear? So far? Good. So I think uh, go on Moodle and find the, the tool there. I will let you know in five minutes when it's time to move on. And then uh, just grab one of those. So we have uh, in the front, in the back. And uh, Anna has the markers and try to make an overview. And uh, what I suggested was just having a box with the system and then uh, some arrows to see when there are systems that are actually linked either uh, through some functioning interoperability mechanism, or if you're just sharing data manually. Any questions? Good. Uh, so I think we'll. Uh, Okay, so uh, Shurajit had a good point. I was uh, confusing the tea break time. Let's uh, do the first assignment one. There are there's six minutes until the uh, tea break at three. So let's spend the time until the tea break on the, the first one. And then when we come back 3.30, we continue with the, the architecture drawing. <laughs> 